Hello, I'm Alex Metricardi, Chief Marketing and Public Relations Officer for Living Branches, and today is Friday, May 1st. I'm here today with Ed Brubaker, Living Branches President and CEO. Nice to see you again. Good to see you, Alex. May the 1st. May wow. We made it. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing to be here already. In some ways, it feels like just yesterday, and other times feels like light years away when we started this process. I heard you talking earlier about a new definition of irony. Would you like to share? Yeah, someone shared with me the other week when actually gas was over $2 a gallon. Now it's less than $2 a gallon. But the definition of irony is gas prices at $1.99 and nowhere to go. I think that's going to become more ironic as the weather gets nicer as well. Exactly. Yep. Well, let's start this week. Um, before we do questions and answers, I think we should probably give a summary of where we are at Living Branches with our coronavirus testing and cases. And unfortunately for this week, we are reporting for the first time um, that we have four residents who have passed away um, after testing positive for coronavirus. And two of those were in Harmony House, which is our memory care area and two of those were in Doc Terrace. So we are so sorry to have to report that. And our prayers are with the families and their friends and our caregivers as they're, as they're going through this. Uh, also this week in Doc Terrace, um, we did a lot of testing of residents who had any possible symptom um, and well, as well as their roommates if they were living in a shared room. And from those, we learned that we have 24 residents in Doc Terrace and Country Cottage combined who have tested positive and nine who've tested negative. The situation in Doc Terrace is certainly not what we were hoping the results were going to be. Um, and I think that this probably leads us to a question um, that is the, probably the most asked question that I had this week. And that would be, how do we determine who and when to test, um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the fact that I think the answer to this question uh, is getting a bit more complicated as it now appears that uh, Montgomery County is changing some of their testing guidelines. Yes, and, uh, and I'll be happy to reflect on, on that, Alex, but before I do that, I just want to reflect on that each week it's felt like our videos have progressively gotten longer, and at the end we say, well, how long was that one? Uh, last week was a marathon. Even I got bored listening to it, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll try to keep it a bit uh, briefer uh, and with more brevity uh, as we go forward. But some of these things do get challenging to explain as well, and so that's certainly the reason it, it can take longer. I would also say uh, you mentioned uh, the deaths we had this week, and the reality is there were other things going on in some of these cases too, and in, in at least one case uh, they were on hospice, but that doesn't change the facts that they, they passed and it, it was a sad thing. Uh, it's always sad when family members um, pass away. And as I were, was reflecting on it uh, with my, my wife recently, you know, my parents were both at a retirement community in Lancaster. They died in 2017 and, and my mother had, had dementia. And, and frankly, it was a challenge the last few years to watch her. Uh, I'm glad they didn't have to live through COVID, but I think for me the thing that is uh, most sad, uh, saddens us most, or saddens me the most, is is the death. Yes, but that's part of life, right? Um, my parents died; um, they were at the end of a, a good life. We know that's coming. The challenge is when they die and we can't be with them or they die and we can't have a funeral and a memorial service where our friends and relatives come and greet us. And that to me, I think, is one of the hardest things through this crisis. We still do try to accommodate families at end of life when we feel it's coming, but you don't always know that either. And so that, that is, I would say, one of the most challenging uh, things about COVID and this whole uh, pandemic is that end of life connections that are, are so important uh, for families and their loved ones that just can't take place in the same way anymore. And so that, that is um, truly sad to, to see those things. Related to testing, in many ways we are truly 
building this plane as we're learning to fly it. And it's interesting because there is no one expert that we can go to to say, this is how you do it. So we've been doing a lot of things to try to understand uh, what's going on. Early on in this process, I would read an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, Dr. Josh Wee, who is medical director in Philadelphia. And so our medical director, uh, Dr. Um, Dan Hamowitz, had contacted him and we had a phone call to try to learn from their experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. More recently, we uh, connected with Dr. James Wright, who uh, is medical director at Canterbury, which is a facility outside of Richmond, Virginia, that had quite a few cases of COVID and quite a few deaths. Very helpful conversation, but kind of exploring, should we be testing everyone? Should we be testing only staff, only residents? What do you do with that information that you acquire when you do the testing? There is no one right way to do it. And that's what gets so confusing. So even as we're talking about it internally with Dr. Hamowitz and Murray uh, Sheeran, our infection control uh, preventionist, uh, that it becomes a challenge to figure out what is the right thing to do. And so Murray, who goes to the county and says, what should we be doing? Their perspective had been, when you have a case, assume everyone's positive and treat them as such. There are challenges with that. But there's also challenges if you test everyone. What do you do with that information? Can you cohort? How hard or how easy is cohorting? What do you do with staff who are asymptomatic but may test positive? And are you, can you still have them caring for people who are positive? Which would make sense to do. So we're exploring all these things now, even as we spoke with uh, Dr. Wright the other day and got good information from him. Even as we were speaking with him, it was coming out from the county that their recommendation now is to consider, not absolutely that you must, but that you should consider testing folks in long-term care and perhaps even staff. Well, we had a conversation with the county, some representatives from the county yesterday to talk about what does this all mean? Because it's one thing to say, test everyone. It's a whole nother thing to say, what does that mean when they're positive? What does it mean when they're negative? Because as I said, I think on a, another video, a negative test doesn't give you quite as much information. It doesn't give you the confidence because a negative test says that day of test, they were negative. Dr. Wright also explained that early on, it took them 11 days to get test results from California to Virginia. Well, a lot can happen in 11 days, right, Alex? I mean, a lot can happen. Testing has gotten much better, but what do you do with the information? Do you then cohort? A positive test, it's more readily apparent what you should do. It's good to cohort, put them with other positive persons so they don't spread to negative. But is the negative yesterday negative and today positive? You don't really know that. So it's very important to be able to turn tests around much more quickly. And that's happening much better than it had been just a few weeks ago. So that's the challenge. What do you do? How do you test? So we're really in the midst of right now speaking with the county and other experts to try to figure out what is the best way forward. And what does that even mean over the next few months as we decide how to start reopening the facilities? Uh, never <laughs> back to the pre-February or pre-March times. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But just even to have small group activities for our residents, et cetera. And so we're, we're really literally working on that right now and really hope to have some, some additional conversations with the county as well uh, because we feel it's important to learn from those who have plowed this before us so we can hear what worked for you, what did you learn through this. There is no one expert. Our infection control preventionist, Murray Sheeran, does a great job, knows a lot about infections, but really doesn't know much about this one because no one does. She really knows how to manage flu symptoms and does a great job with that. In fact, we had some of that this winter that really she did a great job and the staff did wonderfully with it. But this is different. We're learning new things every day. 
people who are asymptomatic but still shedding the virus so they can be infect, you know, infecting others during that time. So the whole idea of masking is very important and all those kinds of things. So we feel like we're doing a lot of things right, following CDC guidelines, following what the county directives are, but this whole business of testing is not as easy as it might see on a, seem to be on a soundbite on TV um, because it has a lot of implications. What do you do with the results of the test? How do you treat those residents? How do you treat the staff persons? So it's something that is really, quite, quite frankly, a moving target, and we'll continue to work at that as we um, explore with other experts and really collaborate together to find out what, is the, what are the best uh, protocols as we move forward. I appreciate your analogy about, it seems like we're uh, flying the plane while we're building the plane. And I think for me, probably the single most frustrating thing about all of this is that I would like to think that if we follow the guidance of the experts and do everything that they're telling us we should be doing, which is what we're doing, that we ought to be able to stop this from happening. And clearly that's not the way it works in the real world. But I think that's a challenge for a lot of us, is that we think we should be able to prevent this. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the reality is it couldn't be further from the truth. You can hopefully manage it uh, perhaps a bit, but you cannot prevent it 100%. And so that is the challenge. And that's the challenge too. I mean, I've had these conversations with Murray uh, Sheeran, our infection preventionist, and that's one of the things that I know is so frustrating for her because she wants to follow the rules. She wants to follow those things that she's told to do, and she does that very well. But when I come with something new and different, or Dr. Hamowitz does, and we talk about that, that's different from what the county directive is, um, what do we do with that? And as the reality is, as a physician told me recently, some of the experts in this area, in some things, know no more than you or I. So we too need to use our brains. And so I'm one, frankly, I don't hesitate to ask questions, frankly. And, and I'll ask people, like, I understand why you think it works that way, but help me understand your logic because I'm not following your logic. And so um, it's by that give and take that we can um, really come to places where we understand this better. But pre-March, we didn't know a lot about it. And I would say pre-last December, I can't even tell you that I knew what coronavirus was. Now I find out that it's been around for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, we're learning this stuff over the last few months uh, of something we hadn't been speaking of, at least in most circles, for the last while. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, potential treatments? Um, we've had some conversations about this, and certainly uh, there's a lot of information in the news. Um, I'm pretty sure Lysol should not be one of our potential treatments, but there's been lots of information. What have we learned that we could share with people? Yeah, and I think we all want to hear, I mean, my ears even perk up, you know, we're watching nightly news last night and they said, promising new vaccines or here's a potential game changer. And all of a sudden you're perking up and you're saying, wow, could this be the thing? So we are all very interested in that and I totally get it because that's right where I'm at too. Having said that, we also need to temper that with realism and say, what is going on here? It would appear that remdesivir is a medication or a drug that has promise. Having said that, when you hear it on TV, everybody goes out to the pharmacist or their doctor and says, I want remdesivir for my loved one. That's not quite how it works, unfortunately. It is an IV drug only administered in the hospital and only really recommended for a certain window, if you will, of the disease. I was told by a physician this morning that it's really not recommended or should not be used after they're already on a ventilator if they get to that point. It has to be done intravenously, so it has to be done in a hospital setting. There's no pill of remdesivir that you can take in an outpatient setting. That's really ideal if you could have that, but it's not there. So 
you hear these sound bites and you get excited, but there's always, always the details that have to be looked at. And so that's really the challenge. This physician also told me that um, the government is really pushing vaccines and, the, and pushing out vaccines more quickly than the treatments. That's where the real money's going. Um, I don't know if I'd say behind the scenes, but that's where it's flowing. Now that's a big bet because if it doesn't work, then you might have lost some windows for your treatments. But he also said there's some really promising opportunities, and we've probably all heard about some of them too on TV, uh, for a potential vaccine, and that would be wonderful. But even in those cases, best case scenario is probably not till late fall. And when I say late fall, I'm talking Thanksgiving. And even in the vaccine world, that's incredibly fast. So we just need to listen, look at the details, understand there's way more than the big headline that uh, attracts your attention, but also know that there are a lot of incredibly smart people working on this stuff. I mean, it's fascinating. It's just fascinating. And um, I believe that there will be treatments, including remdesivir, that seems to have some promise, not for everyone, but in some cases, I believe that we'll eventually have a vaccine, but it's not going to happen overnight. And it doesn't change the fact that we in Living Branches serve the most vulnerable, and particularly those in healthcare or skilled nursing are the most vulnerable uh, population uh, to be served. Yeah, well, that's, I think, a good segue into another question that we have. Um, Terry sent in a question. Do staff members travel between the three Living Branches communities? Um, thinking of this from a infection prevention <laughs> uh, perspective, he says, um, what are you doing uh, to prevent the spread? And if we're not going to have vaccines, we're going to be preventing the spread for a while. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's a very good point. And early on in the coronavirus response team, we did talk about this and address that. When our campuses were all COVID free, it was a little bit different discussion than now that we have a COVID positive residence at Doc Woods. And so we do not share back and forth uh, between campuses and we work hard to not share between facilities, you know, an unaffected uh, personal care facility with a memory care facility, let's say, at Doc Woods. So we really work hard at doing that. But as far as staff between campuses, we're, we are not doing that uh, like we did be before there were COVID positive because it, it really is important to keep them separate. I believe staff, um, for the most part, uh, you know, follow good uh, PPE techniques because it's impossible to do that 100% right, but they do a great job with that. But even so, and proper, you know, cleaning of your hands and all that kind of thing, there's still a risk. And so we want to avoid that. And so we do uh, restrict those kind of opportunities between campuses. But I will say that creates staffing challenges too, uh, yeah. which is always weighing um, as we, we look at what our options are. I was on, at Doc Woods actually this week um, talking uh, to some of the front desk team and they were sharing a story that they had heard from Dining Services about just little things that you wouldn't think of that could help prevent infection, um, which is, for example, now the staff, the team members, staff members in Harmony House and Doc Terrace, they are delivering all of their meals to them there so that they don't have to walk through the hallways, they don't have to come into the bistro. And I think it even sounds like they're taking the food uh, the trays, putting it in the vestibule and then stepping back and then the other the residents or the staff members from Terrace um, and Harmony come out to get them. So everything that we possibly can do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and again, Dr. Wright from Virginia talked about doing those kinds of things at their facility, having direct entrances from the outside that were different from the non-COVID parts of the facility. Sometimes you're not able to do that. That's the reality. So you work with the physical plant that you have but absolutely, those things are very important. Um, let's. We. I think we made it on a on a short version of this of this talk this week. Good job to us. So we're only twenty five minutes. We're only twenty five minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> 
Do you have anything you'd like to share in closing? Well, I, I guess I, I probably have said this most every week, at least I hope I, I did, and just recognizing the, the commitment from our residents, but also our staff members in, in this process, it's really hard. Uh, I mean, this is getting old, and I reflected on that other weeks as well. But even so, my life is better even in this challenging time than frankly many others in other parts of the world. But having said that, it's still different and it's still hard, so we don't want to minimize that. And so our staff is really doing great work and, and really showing love and care to persons. Um, there was a person, uh, a friend uh, from the community that uh, his uh, relative is in one of our facilities and they were able to come in and see them. and. Um, they, they commented they felt they were getting in a hazmat suit to come in that uh, in that evening to see their their loved one, and they just reflected too about the care and service that our staff was giving. I think they used the word heroes, that they were heroes uh, in the, in the work that they did, and they they really truly are um, coming in doing what needs to be done. These are not just room one, bed one, these are Mrs. So-and-so who I've known for months or years. And that's what makes it difficult, but it also is what makes it rewarding. And so staff uh, continues to really work at that in so many, many positive ways. And so I'm, I'm just incredibly proud of our staff and what they do every day uh, and what our residents do every day too in the discipline because this is not fun for our residents either. So, but it's really important for us to work at these things together. Yeah. I saw um, nice pictures out of the Willows actually, uh, where uh, Seth Laux, our creative arts therapist, was leading a properly socially distanced and masked um, singing group with residents. And it just, it was a good reminder that we're concentrating, I think, on the difficult things that are happening, but there are still good things, maybe, albeit different than what it used to be, um, but still good things going on on the campuses. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, I guess I would also reflect on that. We talked about this at CRT this morning, that um, it's easy to focus on the negative, and, and we, we absolutely do not want to forget the people that have passed there are also people that have passed at other times, um, even during coronavirus, that were not from coronavirus. Those, that cycle of life continues, and it, it's, it's still sad, obviously, just like it was sad pre-coronavirus. The flip side is, is that it's easy to think about the person that got it or that passed away. Important to do those things, but we also got it want to remember the people that got it and recovered, the staff member that got it and recovered and is now back to work. I heard a number from a physician that perhaps up to 25% of seniors in long-term care who contract the virus could pass away, which sounds like a big number, and it is. The flip side is that means 75% did not. And it's not at all that I want to suggest that we shouldn't remember those who have passed. That's not the point. But we also need to focus on the positive things that are happening as well um, through this crisis and how we can support each other as humans through this. Thank you again for joining us this week. As a reminder, we'll be back again next week answering your questions. So if you have questions, you can email them to us at coronavirusquestions at livingbranches.org. You can also check our website because all information is on the website, and that is livingbranches.org slash coronavirus. Thank you.